Welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast, the podcast where we talk about sexual abuse cases in the hope that it will assist listeners in openly discussing topics which have been ignored for too long. This podcast is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. We are lawyers, so we tend to speak about the legal aspects of abuse cases, but we aren't too shy to speak up about the broader issues faced by survivors of sexual abuse too. We hope that you find it interesting, but more than that, if you are a survivor of sexual abuse, we hope that you find our discussion empowering. Hello, my name is Alan Collins. I'm the partner who heads up the abuse team at Hugh James. Welcome to this latest podcast brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. So today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Roland Angerer from Child Fund. But before we get underway, as always, I have to give a little health warning. These podcasts often cover very sensitive issues. Some of the subject matters can be distressing. So if you think you might be upset by the content of this podcast, now's the time to switch off, go and do something else. Otherwise, please do stay with us. So as I said, I'm joined today by Roland from Child Fund. Thank you for joining me, Roland. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So I'm going to get Roland to introduce himself and also Child Fund. So perhaps in reverse order, perhaps tell us a little bit about Child Fund and then explain who you are. Yes, with pleasure. Child Fund International is an organization that has been around for a while, since 1938. Our focus is, as the name already says, on children and children's rights all around the world. And currently we have reached a level of 11 members in our Child Fund Alliance, so different organizations from different countries. And we are operating in around 50 countries around the world with a program that is uh, focused on child sponsorship. So we work at community level with families, with people around the children to build protective circles and to strengthen the capacities of those children from the, the age of zero to 24 years. Excellent. So looking at your website, under uh, Here for Children since 1938, why? Because we need each other. And you've got some very powerful, if I may say so, strap lines, if that's the right terminology. We are people who know that we can't afford to lose a single child to hunger, violence, disease or neglect. And that when children grow up healthy, educated and safe, everyone wins. We are parents, teachers, entrepreneurs, doctors, artists, social workers, advocates, and grown up kids of all ages and life parts all around the world who believe every child should be free to do what they do best, play, learn, grow, explore, and experience the wonder of life. Okay, so you're based in, I think, Thailand. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. I'm the regional director for Child Fund International in Asia. So I'm based in Bangkok, Thailand, and I look after a program in five countries, which include India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and Thailand itself. Okay, so what is, in a little detail, your day job? My day job, uh, that's a very good question. It's usually, I work a lot online. That has become the standard practice over the last few years. But I do supervise the teams in those five countries who are looking after the programs we implement at community level. So my action is mostly with the country directors of these countries, but I also work with the regional partners, and I hope I can come back to that in uh, in a minute, organizations who have an outreach throughout Asia, crossing borders, so to say, and influence them and try to bring them or align them or align us with their agendas, which protect children and help children to grow up healthy, educated, skilled and safe. So give me some examples of the current programs that you and your partners are working on. We have an approach where we go by life cycles. So our primary intervention is for children under six. So that's the life stage one. And there we work starting from zero, basically with pregnant women, with lactating mothers. It's a lot about nutrition and healthcare at these early stages. But then also the preschool intervention where we do early stimulation and working with childhood and child care centers, which prepare children for the schooling age. Then that becomes the life cycle. Number two is when children go to school. And there we focus a lot on the outcomes and the quality of learning. So under which conditions do children go to school, if at all they have the chance to do so? How do we prepare teachers well? 
And at this life stage already, how can we protect them from violence and abuse? Because that's when they're starting to be exposed to that phenomenon seriously. And life stage three is after the schooling age, when they become adolescents. There we focus a lot on uh, sexual reproductive health, but also the preparation for the labor market or making them ready to become responsible adults who can cater for their own families as they grow into uh, becoming parents themselves. Okay, so let's look at some of the issues that you must be facing in this increasingly, what appears to be increasingly complex and troubled world that we're living in, where there are so many pressures being brought to bear on children, young people and their families. Yeah, well, the issues are many and uh, they're not going away. The COVID crisis has actually deepened the number of poverty related issues, not only in Asia, but uh, actually around the globe. But what we are particularly concerned about is the digital world has opened up new spaces of opportunities on the one side, but also on uh, risks for children uh, in the cyberspace on the other side. And that's why we have started a campaign now, which is called Web Safe and Wise, in which we're trying to address some of these aspects that are emerging uh, around children in the cyberspace. Okay, so let's look at that in a little detail, because in my work, I come across NGOs and organizations trying to work in this area. It all seems extremely challenging. So Child Fund, with their Web Safe and Wise, what are you doing that is different or maybe more effective than others? Well, I hope that it is uh, at least uh, effective. That's the, the main objective we have. I think what we can bring to the, the practice and the discussion is to work directly with communities and children. So we really start with saying, OK, how can we teach and help children to navigate the cyberspace safely? How can they protect themselves? How can they be aware of all the pitfalls, of all the risks which are out there? And as I said before, those are new areas of, of work where, which nobody knows much about. So they have to learn it, but also we engage with their protective cycles around. So how are the caregivers, the parents, the school teachers? Uh, what do they know about these risks in the cyberspace? Usually relatively little, uh, but mm. we need to train and prepare them for that so that they can help and guide children appropriately when they so, go online. So the children and young people are usually, how can I put it, far more sophisticated with the technology than the adults. Exactly. So, so the adults are immediately at a distinct disadvantage. But the children are usually not prepared or often underestimate with what malice they might encounter along the way when they're online and what people may be on the other end and on the other side and what their intentions may be. Mm. So they, they may be ingenuous when they go in, on the cyberspace. Seems to me that inadvertently maybe the burden, it falls on the children and the young people. And that's not intentional, of course, but that may be the end result because there isn't that ring of protection well, around them, which you would normally expect to be exercised by the teachers of the parents and other adults in, in their circle. Yeah, no, I'm sorry if that came across like that. I think <laughs> it's not about putting the responsibility on their shoulders, but giving them the tools so that they can mm -hmm. defend themselves and and sure, protecting. sure. What I'm saying is, is that inadvertently the risk is maybe in some communities because you haven't got maybe the, the sophisticated understanding amongst the adults. You end up by default placing responsibility on the children. And maybe that there's no other option. Maybe there's no, no, I there's think no there alternative. Is. I think there is, Ellen. I think we need to talk here about policymakers. We need to talk about society responsibility and what control mechanisms we can put in place. So I usually compare it with new technologies, say about 100 years ago, people started to use uh, motor cars in the streets. And suddenly it became a risk for children to run out of the house and, spill, uh, and, and play in the streets because yeah. they may be hit by a car. So they had to learn about this risk and how to behave when they get out of the house. But also society had to put in place rules and regulations. They had to what we have now. Huh? We have uh, white lines on the on the road, which are zebra crossings and pedestrian crossings. We have red traffic lights where the cars yeah. stop. 
So these are the roads. But there's also the car manufacturers who have been called to books and said, OK, well, you need good braking systems. You need advertence schemes like lights and uh, hooters in your cars that make people aware of the risk. And we have uh, a police force that reinforces the rules and regulations and knows exactly how to bring people to book who don't uh, follow the rules. And all that is not existent right now when we look into the cyberspace. Yeah. We don't have these clear rules and regulations. We don't have legal systems which can work and identify who are the perpetrators. And there is very little on law enforcement to actually bring people to books who, who do bad things and violate children's rights. And, uh, yeah. the Good analogy. So what do you find when you're talking to policymakers and law enforcers? Is there resistance or willingness or is it a case of inertia? No, I think as usually in, in big administrations, you find people of, of all colors and shades, but I do feel there is an awareness that there is a problem. So I see that growing and particularly here in Asia, we can see since 2019, the ASEAN organization has brought out a, a protocol for the protection of children when they're online. So ASEAN is, a, is an interstate organization which uh, produces papers and documents which are not necessarily legally binding, but at least they have taken that up as an issue and they promote that and they recommend it to the member states to say, do something about your legal systems to ensure that this is being becomes obligatory and becomes requirements. The only country in the region that has done so is the Philippines. They have passed a law for the protection of, of children online and the uh, Child Fund was, together with others, uh, quite uh, instrumental to bring that into the public discussion and then uh, push and help to push that across the line in the parliament. Those are the signs that we are moving into the right direction. Where I do not see enough movement for, from my perspective is in the service providers. So the technology companies, in my opinion, are called to do more to help us to identify who are those perpetrators. Where do they sit in the world? Because child online sexual abuse is done by individuals who are anonymous and maybe anywhere in the world. Yep. And the material then is distributed around the globe, um, kind of tracking that and finding ways how we stop that. Saying putting the red lights, the red traffic lights into the system. That needs a technology solution, and, and that's what I, where I don't see much of progress so far. Yeah. Are there any cultural issues that get in the way? Yes and no. You can see, well, culture, if you see, for example, language, you see more and more online uh, exploitation happening in countries that have English-speaking uh, background. So the Philippines has become really a hotspot uh, over the last few years because children and, and people speak English, and that is good for online material. Whilst in other countries where they speak local languages, it is obviously more difficult to yes. market whatever comes out of this. The other aspect is, I think, more has to do with youth culture. So I just came back from, from Sri Lanka last week. There they were talking about young people using the Internet a lot to actually what they did before, kind of looking good and being nice and promote themselves amongst their friends. And they send around pictures and where they look nice and with fancy clothes and so forth. And little are they aware that there are people out there who are actually exactly looking out for that and try to get in contact with them. And we heard the story of a, of a girl who actually was approached by somebody, a person we don't know because behind the profile that approaches you, anybody can be behind that. And kind of it started the grooming. Yeah? So kind of, yeah, you look yeah. nice and you look sexy and this picture is beautiful and you're close. And well, can't you take off the clothes and uh, show a little bit more of your body and kind of talking her into that, then actually bringing her across to send over a, a, a nude picture. And I must say that whole thing was done on Snapchat. Really? Snapchat yeah. promotes itself to say, OK, it's a safe space because the pictures will disappear after a couple of seconds. But in this case, the other side, the person on the other side made a screenshot of the picture right. and then could use it. And the, the girl was not aware that this was happening yeah. and the, yeah. how her material was being used. And when she sent over the, the, the nude picture, then the person started blackmailing her and saying, OK, I will share that widely. I will share it with your parents and your teachers unless you organize other girls to send me nude pictures. So she became the intermediary. And uh, I think in that case, they talked about 40 other girls who she 
talked into sending over nude pictures and nobody knows where those pictures ended up. But that's how it works and how, how this youth culture of, of being nice and looking good suddenly yeah. leads you into a, a very dangerous situation. And as she did not report in time and did not have anybody to go to to say who can yeah. help me with this, it took uh, on this relatively big scale for her. Yeah, no? yeah. Uh, but you can imagine the, the psychological mm. pressure she mm. was under and uh, until she managed to to kind of finally, I think the girl number 40 or so then suddenly became suspicious and started to yeah. talk some, to, to some adults and then it became known what had happened yes. before. We've had some cases here in the UK very recently where a victim actually sued the, the blackmailer, the perpetrator, for the psychological, psychiatric harm that he caused her. The blackmailer could be identified? Yes. Okay, well, that's yeah. the big problem usually that you don't know who it is and yeah. uh, identities are hidden. Yeah, big learning curve for everybody. And um, it's frightening, it's nightmarish, but yeah, it's everyone, whether they like it or not, needs to know about it. Yeah, and we need to learn about it. As you rightly said, uh, we must not leave the children alone with this problem. We as adults have the responsibility to also learn how to deal with it and what to do and to push and install protective measures and places and reporting systems and uh, have organizations and individuals who can respond and uh, address the stresses and this uh, pain yeah. children are going through. Yeah, I use an example when talking about this. A year or two ago, turned on the television, there was some, I can't even remember what the name of the program was, I was just switching through the channels, and there was some US mainstream television program, obviously aimed at people in their late teens and 20s. And it showed some college students, so they were in their late teens, early 20s, all, you know, very smartly dressed, all looking very attractive, you know, clean cut, that sort of thing. A male sent from his home using his iPhone, this is all played out as part of a, whatever the television program was about, whatever the story was about, he sent from his, his iPhone, obviously an intimate picture of himself to one of the girls and she immediately got on her bicycle and cycled over to his house and two and two made four if you get what I mean but that was normalizing the use of an iPhone the sending of intimate images and there's a reward at the end of it for the pair of them so to speak mm. and that was normalizing something that was inherently dangerous and that's mainstream television. So I think one of the big yeah. challenges is society, cultures need to appreciate that they are inadvertently normalising what could be a vain, very dangerous activity for children and young people. Yes, no, absolutely. And uh, we have to, at all levels, we need to address that and we have to recognise that at all levels for us, this is new and yeah. different than, than before. And we have in Asia, we have developed with our Australian uh, organization, Child Fund Australia, a training program which is called Swipe Safe. And that really takes into account this protective circle of adults around the children. And they're involved in that learning and training. So they learn their basic uh, digital skills, how to support their children online, how to find out what are the, the triggers or the indicators when a child is in danger, how can they build the confidence in supporting children and youth or online. Because what we want to avoid, and that probably goes back to your question on culture, what we want to avoid is that the adults say, okay, then my child cannot use the internet. Because that would be uh, um, yeah, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, because yeah. of course the digital world is nowadays a, a major player or major space where lots of connections are being built and even uh, professional and uh, future income opportunities are for those children and they need to know and they need to be literate and need to be well prepared to move and work in that space. So the adults need to learn and accept that as well and not just say no, no, then you cannot use the cell phone or you cannot use the computer because then that will deprive them from opportunities. Before we close, I know you wanted to talk to me about regional partners. Yeah, that's a, a, an important point. Thank you so much. We, of course, try to get in touch and collaborate with those organizations who have similar objectives and goals. Probably the biggest and the 
the one most focused on the topic is ECPAT International. That's an organization that is really focused on, on sexual exploitation around the world. And they have partners and chapters in, uh, in 110 countries. So definitely the, those will be important partners for us. There's also a lot of research going on. So the data and information, we get a lot from them. But then there's also the UN agencies. UNICEF has declared and has been uh, instrumental in pushing governments to take the matter seriously. And we will support them. And as I said before, our added value is that we bring in the, the voices of children. We can bring them through our networks and the community work we do. We can bring them uh, into the discussions even with government so that they can explain themselves what they need or what threats or what fears they may have when they navigate the cyberspace. So that's why we, we try to find the best way how we can collaborate and bring in the added value from our end. Good, thank you. And so if anyone listening to this podcast wants more information about Child Fund, they, the best place to go is to childfund.org on the internet. Exactly, that's a good place to start. And there is a number of spots you can click through then to find more information out about the campaign itself, but also about our other work we're doing around the world. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Roland, for joining this podcast today. Much appreciated. I know that from the feedback that we get from our listeners, they really appreciate this sort of conversation, even though it's, you know, we're touching upon matters that we would rather think never existed and could not happen, but we live in the real world and we have to be informed and realistic and um, and that's how we hopefully change things for the better. So thank you very much, Roland. Thank you very much, Alan. It was a pleasure talking to you. All the best. Thank you very much. So I will bring this podcast to an end. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening. If you have any comments or suggestions as regards future podcasts, then please do get in touch. Thank you for listening to this episode of HJ Talks About Abuse. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you'd like to speak to us about something you've heard today, we'd love to hear from you email us at aboutabuse at hjtalks.co.uk.